what is the role of humans as you understand it in the theory of everything with what we know today? And how is it different and special? What we know of the universe at the moment is the universe in the past. Everything we see is in the past, and the deeper we look into the universe, the deeper into the past we look. And if the universe is going to last a long time, you know, it may last an infinite time, or the theories that say it's going to last a finite time, that time is very, very large. And in either case, what we see of the universe is very, very untypical accordingly. The way I now nowadays put this is that in the past, there's been a kind of rule of thumb in the universe, which I call the hierarchy rule, which is that massive energetic things strongly affect less massive, less energetic things, but not vice versa. So if a comet strikes the sun, then the comet is completely destroyed, but the sun hardly notices. And if it weren't for this rule, if it weren't for this hierarchy rule, physics would be much, much more difficult because we then couldn't understand a star unless we knew what its planets were doing. And we couldn't understand what its planets were doing unless we also understood what meteors hit the planet and so on. So the fact that big things could be affected by small things, then they could also be affected by small details of themselves. And we couldn't understand much at all without knowing lots of detail. In reality, we could understand a lot about astronomy without even knowing that many of the things out there even exist. And it's the same with small things. We can understand why crystals, this is a very nice part of the history of science, by the way. You look at a crystal and you see that the faces are at certain angles to each other. How do you explain those angles? Well, it's with the atomic theory. They explained the, the different ways that atoms can be stacked before we'd, anyone had ever seen an atom or knew what the atoms were. So there's a rule of thumb, the hierarchy rule, that large things are not affected by small things. It's not a law of nature. It is an accidental feature of the very early universe. That is to say, the universe kind of up to now. But the hierarchy rule has already been broken four billion years ago by the emergence of life. The emergence of life was really an event that happened in a single molecule. Never mind the emergence of life, because the thing that really violated the hierarchy rule was the emergence of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is a mutation of a gene for an earlier type of photosynthesis that did not produce oxygen and was less efficient. But the oxygen-producing photosynthesis was a mutation. That mutation happened in one molecule, one DNA molecule. And that molecule went on to change the entire surface of the Earth. The entire atmosphere was converted from carbon dioxide to oxygen, and all the substances on the surface of the Earth were converted as well, some of them into minerals. All the iron ore on the surface of the planet is thought to have been created by the oxygen in the atmosphere interacting with other materials on the surface of the Earth. So this one molecule has utterly transformed the whole surface of the planet, which is something like 10 to the 40 times its mass. So somebody looking at the Earth from the other side of the galaxy and seeing that oxygen form, could know that the hierarchy rule has been violated on Earth. That's sort of an amazing amount of violation, but that's nothing compared with what people can do, with what explanatory creativity can do, because biological evolution is severely limited in its ability to create knowledge. It can only create knowledge where every step, every slight change to the existing knowledge is itself an improvement, or at least not a disadvantage. This limits what biological evolution can do. If you think about, say, humans inventing fire, 
sorry, it wasn't invented by humans. It was invented by some precursor species who were also people. So those people invented fire and it was terribly useful. It would have been useful to many other species as well, but they never evolved it, probably because there was no sequence of steps, each of which was advantageous. Whereas a human with creative imagination can see, let's say, a burning branch left over from a forest fire or something like that, and can think, it's getting late. We know they've been on a hunting trip. We might not get home before it gets dark, which would be terrible, <laughs> life-threatening. But maybe if we take that branch, it will light our way home. Now, that hunter can have that thought and can go and reach for the branch because he can creatively imagine that he will survive and benefit from it. Evolution can't creatively imagine. All the changes it makes are before the natural selection, which makes the genes better. So it's the other way around. It's the other way around for people. Everything is the other way around for people. So my other favorite example is the aliens who are watching us would see, is that they would eventually see an asteroid heading towards the Earth and then being deflected. And they would know that not only does that violate the hierarchy rule, but it couldn't be done by just by evolution, which also violates the hierarchy rule, but people violate it by an enormous factor more. So as I said in, I think it was in a TED talk, that once humans have reached a factor of 10 to the 40 of violating the hierarchy rule, we will be controlling the galaxy. And if you take that a bit further, that means that astrophysics will become more and more the history of what people do. At the moment, when we look at an astronomical event, we don't take into account what people do. But by the time we've reached that factor of 10 to the 40, you won't be able to tell what the star will do unless you know something about what people will do. So in this model, humans become central to the universe. They're not a sideshow. Yeah, people, knowledge, these things all go along together. I found a, an amazing quote from the 19th century by a ge an Italian geologist called Antonio Stoppani. I think it's Antonio. And he, he wrote a geology book, and he said that the final layer, you know, he was talking about all the layers of, and the ages in the, the history of the earth. And he said, I have no hesitation in calling this, he said, the anthropogenic era. Nowadays, it's called the Anthropocene era, and it's used as a term of abuse, as if, you know, the Anthropocene is the era during which humans destroy everything. But Stoppani was pleased with the Anthropocene, as we would say. And he wrote a beautiful passage about how this is a, a new law of nature that is on the same par, on the par with the laws of gravity. And well, I forget what he said. So in this model, humans are central to the universe. You're not going to understand the universe without understanding humans, people, or minds, or whatever succeeds us because of the knowledge that we create. Knowledge can travel from one planet to another and transform it completely and utterly, violating this hierarchy rule of thumb that we have seen in the old universe. And I think you've defined knowledge, or you've said that one of the principles of knowledge is that knowledge is a thing that causes itself to be replicated in the environment because it is useful. So knowledge can live inside our DNA and our genes, and the genes that are correct and useful get replicated, not just in the universe, but possibly even in the multiverse. And as an aside, one beautiful output of that that I saw in one of your books was that if you were to look at, there's lots of ways to be wrong, but there's only a few ways to be right, or there are certainly less ways to be right than there are to be wrong. And because the ways that are right are likely to be copied, if you were able to peek at the entire multiverse at once, you would see truth as a thing that is repeated across the multiverse. So I took that in a fanciful way as a meaning of life, which is I want to be the version of myself that is successful in the most instances of the multiverse, yeah, yeah. because that contains the most truth. We want to be multiversal crystals. 
Yes, the closer you are to the truth, the more of you that exists in the multiverse <laughs> in a very odd way. So there, there's your practical application of multiverse theory combined with epistemology. Can you give us your definition of wealth? And then as a follow-up to that, I think naturally comes, are we running out of resources? Wealth is not a number. I don't think it can be characterized very well by a number. It is a set. The set of all transformations that you are capable of bringing about, that is your wealth. And obviously, if optimism is true, then there's no limit to wealth. And at any one time, there is a rough correlation between the wealth, that is the set of all transformations that you could bring about, and other things that aren't very fundamental, like the amount of money you have, or the amount of energy you control, or the amount of land you control, or the amount of power you have, and so on. But those are not fundamental. They are all outgrown eventually by the growth of knowledge. So at the moment, if you have a lot of gold, you can bring things about by exchanging the gold for knowledge that other people have. If you want a painting of yourself, you can hire a painter to make the painting of yourself, even if you couldn't. But in the long run, gold won't do that, because in the long run, some other knowledge that is growing will be able to get gold from an asteroid, and then gold will become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and artists will no longer accept gold. Ultimately, what they will accept, and it's also true today, because the economy is a rather imperfect way of accounting for knowledge creation. It's true that it's rather imperfect, so people can acquire money and power and so on, sometimes without creating much knowledge. But again, in the long run, that is not true. So in the long run, the only thing you could pay the artist with would be more knowledge, kind of knowledge that he's not good at creating. When you have an idea, let's say you're a geologist or something, you have an idea about geology, suddenly your idea has converted some rocks into a resource. And you haven't even touched it yet. The rock has been converted into a resource without anyone ever touching it. Just the idea in the mind of somebody has converted the rock into a resource. I mean, I've just mentioned asteroids. Somebody thought of mining asteroids. Nobody's mined an asteroid yet, but they have already made asteroids more valuable just by thinking of that. And before anyone had those ideas, the objects, the physical objects in question, obeyed the hierarchy rule. But as soon as you have that knowledge, it was the other way around. The hierarchy rule people turn everything the other way around. It's the, instead of massive energetic things dominating less massive, less energetic things, it's things with more meaning that dominate things with less meaning. Things with more knowledge dominate things with less knowledge, or, you know, hopefully no knowledge, because we don't want to dominate people. <laughs> 